Well, good morning, Cornerstone Church. Happy Sunday. Welcome back to the house of the Lord. We're glad you're here. We're going to open our service with the song, God So Love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Would you stand with us? so love the world. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. Mic check one. There we go. Good morning, church. For God so loved the world. What a really great song to start off our morning. And I'm going to do things. I have to say some thank yous. And then when we get to the welcome mug section, y'all have a quick assignment and it will be quick. All right. So thank you to Cheryl and Jay and everyone for helping with the Easter breakfast. Um, I'm sure it was amazingly good. And because we were away, we're going to repeat that in about a week. So um, let's go ahead and get our food together. Uh, I smelled it all the way in Florida. So we missed you all so very much, but we're glad to be back home with our church family. But thank you very much, Ms. Cheryl and um, Mr. Jay and everyone who helped with our breakfast. 
So a very special welcome to everybody. If you are a visitor with us today, please fill out your visitor card. Um, we're gonna give you a mug so you can drink a little bit of coffee or water in it and we want to get to know you. Um, so this is where we have a quick assignment. And my people that are doing the announcements, give me two minutes. Um, we're gonna welcome each other. So you have two minutes to say hello to everybody you can. Ready, get set, go. Two minutes. I tell you, ain't nothing like a little welcome, is it? So if you found at least one person you kind of liked, why don't you give them a hand? I think that would be really kind of cool. Give, give them a hand, literally. There was at least one person you liked. Well, with that kind of clap, I think you found half a person. And, and if you love God today, how about give him a hand? Because we're in the house of the Lord. All right, now that we got all that fun stuff done, let's continue. There is a cookout today. So it's gonna get serious on some cornhole, some volleyball and other sports, I'm sure. And then while we're doing that, there's gonna be some grilling going on. So that's today, 4.30, if you wanna come and have some competition. And then about 5.30, the food should be done in Jesus' name. So come to the cookout at the Malloy's. I think the address is 1963 Antioch Road. Is that right? And I don't even have that in front of me. That's how much I like to go there. So we love y'all. Um, there's a yard sale coming Saturday, April the 20th from 7 to 11 a.m. We've said it the last couple of weeks that there is going to be a different format. So you're going to set up your own yard sale tables and we will assign some youth to come around and to help you set up or maybe their smile might sell a couple of extra things. They will be engaged. So I wanted to share that with you. Don't be afraid to take a youth to come and help you because they will be engaged but we wanna make a lot of money with that. So just be smiling and sell stuff, hallelujah. All right, the baby showers are coming. Molly and Caitlin, April the 20th from two to four. We're gonna have a baby shower for Molly and Caitlin, April the 20th from two to four, and that'll be right here. Is that right? Fellowship Hall, that's right, not in the sanctuary. So we'll be back in the fellowship hall, that's exciting. They've been getting their voices sounding Awesome. We have a cantata coming on May the 5th at 6.30 p.m. That will be held right here. Um, May the 5th, 6.30 p.m. I know um, Isaac's getting them in shape. It's going to be awesome. They're yeah, they're working on it. We look forward to that journey through the Lord's Prayer. Um, our April mom, which is the mission of the month, is the $4 challenge. And for all of those that have been a part of this already, thank you. But we want to go viral. So if any of you want to put it on your Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, any kind of a platform, we're trying to get the world to give us $4. And that's moving us towards our goal. And there's also a QR code. Ooh, Miss Donna. There's a, there's a QR code in the announcement flyer where you can give $4. And just be honest, you spend more than $4 at the Starbucks. So maybe you could take one less, um, I don't know, lavender frothy and maybe get us uh, a $4 challenge toward the portal. If any of you would like to go to see the portal, we're doing tours right now, mostly Tuesdays and Thursdays. 
Um, all you got to do is ask. We'll set it up for you to go and look at it. It is really coming together. We have put together a couple of mock rooms so you can see what the rooms are going to look like. And that's how this $4 challenge is also going to help us. Um, we need your prayers. One week and one day from today, we go before the city for our zoning. So we need your prayers. And right after the zoning, we're going to be really moving towards the grand opening. And thank you all for being a large part of that as we house our homeless and those that are displaced here in this community. Um, Pastor Ryan also wanted me to add to our announcements. There's going to be a men's breakfast here on May the 18th. May the 18th, and that will be in the morning around 0700-ish. No, 0800-ish. 0730. Ask Dan Wise. Don't ask me. So if you see Brother Dan Wise, raise your hand. If y'all don't know who that young man is right there, he's... I'll get there at brunch. Oh, my heavens. There will be a men's breakfast at the CC. Um, we have one of our youth coming forward this morning to do our call to worship and to open us in prayer. And you know what? Sometimes we don't give our teens enough loving, so give some love for Elissa Rasmus and as she comes forward to give us the um, scripture. Good morning. Um, I'm Elissa, and I have the pleasure of reading Psalms 96, verses 1 through 9 today. So I will begin. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. O oh, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory <coughs> among all the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered among all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord is made, has made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him, all the earth. If you guys would bow your heads. Father God, thank you so much that we are all able to gather here and worship you together. And thank you that all people from different walks of life will be able to walk home with that They'll be able to come home learning something new or just with a feeling in their heart and just bless the hands of the musicians and the voices of the singers and of the pastor. And just thank you so much that we are all able to just be here and wake up and come in here and worship you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, would you stand with us as we sing? Our hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
just the only one who could ever say.
to invite the kids to come up for a little prayer before they go off to Children's Church. So come on up, y'all. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. So good morning, little people. How are y'all? Good. <laughs> so today I need y'all to help me just very quickly to remind your parents of when you were little, okay? I was thinking about Buddy this morning, and I remember when he discovered his eyes. So can you show me where your eyes are real quick? Very good. You did good. <laughs> can you tell me where your nose is? Very good. How about your ears? And how about your brain? That's all good. I remember when I was a parent of my little person and I would ask him where those things were and Kayla where those things were and they could tell me and it just made me so proud. So this is what I want to ask you to do. Point to your eyes. You see through those. So I want to ask you for all the days of your life to be very guarded with what you see. I want to ask a blessing over you that you will see good things. That everything that comes into your eyes will be good. Okay? And today, look at your parents and really see them. You'll see something pretty beautiful and handsome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of y'all look like, oh my. But you will. Okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these little people today, and I thank you for their leadership. I pray that you would be with them, God, as they go to their class. But most of all, today, we focus on their eyes and what they see, God. I pray that there will be a guardian over their eyes and that we would guard their eyes, dear Lord, from what they see, for they are the windows to our soul. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would be with parents, dear Lord, and allow for them to see what their kids need to see and to see what their kids don't need to see. And I also pray that as they leave today, headed to their uh, children's moment with their wonderful teacher, I pray, God, that you would condemn us as a people to be very particular about what we let these little people see and to do that holistically. I pray that, God. And when they look at mommy and daddy or guardian or grandparent, I pray they'll see them differently than they ever have. In Jesus' name we pray and we believe what we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go. All right, God bless you all. All right. Thank you, Sandy, for teaching today. So today we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. You know, we've been working our way through the book of Acts, and it's been two years, and we were through 24 chapters, and I got a little feedback from someone that's like, well, can we try something different? And uh, so we're going to try something different. We're going to have a seven-week series. Um, who am I? Who are we as God's people, as people made in God's image? And so I'm kind of figuring this out as we go. I'm not quite sure exactly where we're going with it. We trust the Holy Spirit to lead us. And uh, we're going to start off today at, in 1 Peter. Um, but before we do that, let's, um, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your grace and mercy in Christ Jesus, and 
We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And we thank you, God, that it's no longer, as believers, we can say it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live by faith in the Son of God, uh, I live for your purposes and, and for your glory. Uh, we thank you, God, that we can lift each other up in prayer today. Um, we thank you that we can be a loving and welcoming people, that we're called to be a loving family of faith, uh, called to make your name great, and help us to do that, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the fellowship we look forward to today um, at Tim and Donna's house, and just grateful for our time together as, as a family, as, as believers, as your people. Uh, we thank you, God, for um, Molly and Hunter and, and their baby, and we ask your blessings upon their child and keep her safe, him or her safe, um, and we look forward to bringing this baby into the world and, and celebrating with them. And for Caitlin and Tim as well, we ask your blessings upon Caitlin and, and their child and just watch over these children, knit them together in their mother's womb and uh, keep them safe as they grow and mature. And we just want to welcome them into the world with joy and thanksgiving and, and celebrate these amazing gifts that you've entrusted to these families. God, we're grateful that um, Bill and Olivia DeRuggio are on their way to, or maybe even in Nairobi now, as they're going to be medical missionaries in Kenya for a few weeks. God, help them to be uh, the hands of Christ. Help them to be agents of healing and, and, and health and hope. Uh, use them, God, to embody uh, your love and their entire team. And help them, God, to encounter Jesus in a deep and profound way as they meet other believers in a distant land. May your Holy Spirit be at work in great ways. God, we lift up to you uh, Jody Parker and her family as we grieve with her the passing of her mother. And we thank you for her great age of 91 years of life. We thank you for um, her amazing legacy and how she was working even just up to a few weeks ago before she fell. Um, we ask, God, that you... Um, bring comfort and, and encouragement to this family by the presence of your Holy Spirit. And help us, Lord, to hold on to the awesome promise, the amazing truth, that in Christ Jesus you give your people the gift of eternal life, that you have called her home, and for that we thank you. God, we lift up to you those in our church that are dealing with, um, with physical health issues, Lord. We pray for Luke Taylor as he's been battling cancer, and we ask your blessings to be upon him, Lord. We pray for Betty Stone, and she's been in ICU recently and, and also dealing with cancer, and we pray that you bring her healing and strength and encouragement. Um, may, your, may your presence be very deep and profound in her life. We pray for Dr. Bob Meyer as he's um, dealing with health issues, and um, we ask that you strengthen him and encourage him, and may your Holy Spirit bring comfort and peace to Linda as well. We pray for Grady as he's been battling uh, various health issues and we ask that you strengthen him and encourage him and um, just bless others in our, in our family of faith who have a variety of struggles and issues to deal with. Uh, we lift up to you, Christy, who's, um, who's in prison, and we give her patience in waiting for her time to, to be uh, released. And we just thank you for your grace that's been at work in her life and how you're transforming her and, and drawing her close to you. And just continue to bless her, Lord, and help us to love and encourage her. God, we lift up to you those who are battling addictions, and we pray that you set them free by the power of your Holy Spirit and the glory of your name. God, we thank you for Pastor DJ and Ruthie and all the servants at the four-day ministry. We thank you for this vision that he has to open the portal. And we pray, God, that it truly will be a place of restoration, transformation, accountability, and love, and that lives will be transformed in the name of Jesus for your glory. And we look forward to when it's open soon. And those who are homeless or in transition will have a safe place to stay, a place where they can experience your grace and love. God, help us to be a people that are bold in sharing the gospel, uh, telling others the good news that in Jesus Christ there is forgiveness and salvation. Help us, Lord, not to lose sight of the amazing gift that we celebrated last week in, in Easter, that Jesus is risen to overcome sin and death for us. And God, I ask that you bless this message now and just give us hearts to receive your word. Help us to grow in faith. Help us to realize more fully who we are as people made in your image who have been redeemed by Christ. And let us live out our identity as your people for your glory. Uh, we love you, Lord, and we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Okay, so this is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. And I'd like to ask you now to listen attentively to God's holy word. Peter says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so as I mentioned, the sermon series is called Who Am I? And I'm kind of, kind of figuring this out as we go, but it's a very important topic. I think um, a lot of people don't really understand who we are, who we've been created, who we were created to be. And as we have a deeper and clear understanding of who it is we are, then we begin to experience a, a greater quality of life, a richer and more meaningful life that God wants for us. And, and of course, if we already have a gr- good grasp of who we are in Christ, then this will only be and a source of encouragement and a reminder for us, I think. So, um, but we're, we're made in God's image, and our purpose is to reflect God's image uh, for his glory. And, you know, God is perfect in every way. God is good. And so it is good for us to express who he is in the world. It's good for us to, re- to uh, reflect uh, some of his qualities. And, and as we do that, um, he's glorified. And because we're fulfilling our purpose, or beginning to fulfill our purpose, uh, we experience joy, we experience peace, and we experience uh, meaning in our life. And so I, I, we, want, we want to think of the human race as like 8 billion little mirrors all around the world, all reflecting God's image, all reflecting uh, his, his glory in the world. And it's not a perfect analogy, obviously. Nothing ever is when we're trying to understand God. But just as a mirror reflects the image of a human being, some qualities and characteristics of that person, God has endowed us with the capability to reflect something of who God is. And just as a reflection isn't the person, but it shows something of what the person is like, we're not God. But being made in his image, we can can reveal or express a little bit of what what God is like. And our capacity to do that is very limited, right? Because first of all, because God is the creator of the universe and we're just a little creature, right? And so, for example, one way God demonstrates his greatness as he created out of nothing. Everything is created out of nothing. And we can't do that. We can't create anything out of nothing. But we do have the capacity to reflect his image by being creative, by being imaginative, um, by, by making things, that kind of idea. Another limitation we have in our capacity to reflect God's image is because we're sinful and we're fallen. We're broken people, right? And so even the ways that we do reflect God's image, it's... it's distorted and it's corrupted and it's, it's um, fractured. And so, for example, like God is love. God is just. God is good. And we can do things that are loving. We can do things that are good. We can carry out justice, but it's always going to be broken, fragmented, and fractured because we're fallen people. We're broken people. And we live in a sinful world. And so I was excited to start this, uh, this um the sermon series, and I want to really start off with a bang and have something to really grab your attention. And so I had this brainstorm earlier in the week, and what I was going to do, you see I got um, this, I have uh, Elissa's painting easel over here with a mirror on it. I had this big plan, and um, I started out with two mirrors because I wanted to practice once to see if I, how this worked. It didn't work as well as I'd hoped. But so this is my idea. So we're going to have an apple hanging off a fishing line from the AV booth upstairs, hanging down here. And I was going to recruit Michelle to be Eve, and I was going to be Adam. And, and we walked down the, we walked down the, the, the aisle of the sanctuary. And we, oh, there's the apple. And Michelle would snatch it up. Shouldn't have done that, Michelle. But she grabs the apple, and we bring it back into the front. So the, the easel and the, and the mirror would be right here in front of the communion table. And Michelle would take a bite of the apple, and then she'd give it to me, and I'd take a bite of the apple. And then my plan was to create, like, this shock a shock effect, I was going to take the apple, after we bit into it, after we sinned, I was going to turn and throw it into the, into the mirror and cause the mirror to fracture, to crack. And that was, that, was going to, that was going to demonstrate how our sin causes the image of God in us to fracture, to fragment, to crack. It becomes distorted. It's no longer what it's supposed to be. So I thought, well, maybe this would be a good idea for me to practice this first to see if it actually works. And I got these two mirrors at Walmart, one to practice and one to use Sunday morning. And I looked at the mirror, and it didn't feel, it felt more like plastic than like glass. I was like, is this even going to crack? Is this going to work? So I thought I better practice it once. So Thursday evening, I put the easel in front of the, in front of the communion table, got the mirror up there just like it is now. I kind of walked through it in my mind what I was going to do. And I took the apple, 
And I'm telling you, I threw this apple like I'm trying to strike out Mickey Mantle, because I didn't think it was going to break, right? And I turned around and I threw it, and I wish you could, I wish you could see a video of this. I wish you could replay this in my mind how, how I looked. But the apple didn't just crack the mirror, it went right through the mirror. <laughs> and it just exploded. There was like fragments of glass everywhere, on the communion table, on the floor, on the first row of the pews. There was glass up here underneath the, the piano. And then the really crazy thing was, is the apple disappeared. <laughs> I have no idea what happened to it. You would think it would have hit the, the, the stick in the middle, or thankfully it didn't hit the cross. I was grateful for that. It didn't hit the piano. I don't know what, what happened to it. But the, the apple, the, the cross was covered with chunks of apple. It was crazy. <laughs> And then finally I found, I'm not crying, I found two almost perfect halves of the apple behind that wall over there. And so I would have loved to get a slow-mo video to see how it went through and made it around and whatever. I spent an hour picking up fragments of glass, sweeping stuff up. There are probably still pieces around here someplace. I don't know. So anyway, I decided not to do that. Not a good idea. But just get that image in your mind of in our sin, when, when Adam and Eve took the fruit... They're rebelling against God. They're saying, I want to decide what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, what's true and false. I want to determine for myself um, what is right. They, in effect, they wanted to be like God. And that pride has, has affected all of us. All of us have fallen into sin. All of us are rebellious against God. All of us um, live in pride. And that rebellion against God resulted in what? God driving Adam and Eve out of the garden, right? They were separated from God's presence. It resulted in um, them being guilty and ashamed. They were naked and ashamed, and so there was the schism within themselves. It resulted in being suspicious of each other, and there was a schism in their relationship with each other. And then God even pronounced a judgment upon them where Adam had to till the soil by the sweat of his brow, and, and Eve would bear children in, in pain of childbirth. And we even see this, there's a schism between human beings and the world that we live in, in creation. And so we're fractured, broken, fallen people, and we live in a fraction, fractured, broken, fallen world. And it's in that context where we try to navigate life and try to figure out who we are. How are we called to live? And we ask this question of ourselves, whether we really, whether we really process this or not, all of us, either consciously or unconsciously, are dealing with this question throughout our lives of who am I? What is my purpose in life? How, do I, how am I called to live? And we ask that question um, in the context of how God's plan unfolds in history. And you can really kind of break, theologians like to break up the history of the universe, the history of, of creation kind of in four big epochs, four big, big segments of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Or creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, depending on the terminology uh, they use. And so human beings are called to I, try to identify who am I in, in, this, in this flow of history. And so at creation, God made us to reflect his image. Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden. Everything was beautiful and perfect. They're at peace in a beautiful relationship with God and with each other. Um, and then after the fall came, uh, they fell into sin. And we experienced that reality. We sin as well. And we live now as people who have a fractured and distorted capacity to reflect God's image in the world. Oh, the other thing I didn't tell you about, the other thing I did with the, with the mirror is, I thought this was, was going to be helpful, but it turned out not to be helpful at all. Um, I took packaging tape, this clear, strong tape, right? And I put a vertical line down the mirror and then a little short horizontal line across the mirror to make a cross. And my thinking was that that symbolizes how Christ is at work in the world throughout history. And, and Christ lives in us, and even when I fractured the, the, the mirror with my apple with the sin, I thought the cross would hold it together, right? And so that, that was to demonstrate God's sustaining grace. He continues to be with us in our brokenness, in our sinfulness. And the analogy didn't work very well, but the reality is still, is still reality, that, that in the midst of our sinfulness, our brokenness, by God's grace, he sustains us. By God's grace, he holds us together. He, he goes before us and, and protects us and equips us to live the life that we live, um, even as fallen people. And so, so at, even in the fall, God pr pr proves himself to be gracious. And by sustaining grace, he continues to go with us. And then, of course, the cross also symbolizes 
um, the third epoch of history, the third stage of history, and that is redemption. And that's what we celebrated last Sunday at Easter, is that Jesus came into the world to, to redeem us from our sin. He paid the penalty for our sin uh, through his death. And he conquered sin and death through his own, his own death and resurrection. And now the Holy Spirit is at work in those of us who have put our trust in him. And he begins to kind of mend the broken pieces of that mirror together. Kind of gets the super glue out and starts to mend things together so that we, a little more faithfully, uh, a little more intentionally, uh, begin to reflect God's image back to him for his glory and, and back to the world uh, as a blessing to one another. But what we look forward to is, is the age of, con- of consummation. And that's the time when Jesus is going to come back and he's going to create a new heaven, a new earth. Everything's going to be good and perfect and right and true. And we're going to be made new again too. And we're going to become the perfect version of ourselves. And at that point in eternity, then we will, to our fullest capacity, and somehow even beyond that, growing throughout time, have an increasingly greater capacity of reflecting God's glory back to himself and and to each other. And that will um, bring God glory because we're fulfilling our purpose for him and it'll bring us joy um, as we more fully experience who we're called to be. So people in this fallen world, they, they don't understand God's plan or they haven't accepted faith in in Jesus just yet, they're searching and they're looking and they ask the question, who am I? And again, a lot of people I don't think maybe, maybe uh, what, um, consciously process this. They just kind of get along in life without really thinking about too much. But I think if you could really get inside their heart, really get inside their mind and ask the question, who do you think you are? And they would say to themselves, who am I? One of the first responses they would say, they would have is, I am alone. I, I, am, I am unloved. I'm lost. That's, that's the consequence of the fall. It, it fractures our relationship that we have with God and with each other and within ourselves, and it leaves us in a state of loneliness and, and discouragement. And, and you know, people do all kinds of things to anesthetize ourselves from our loneliness. And we spend crazy amounts of time watching TV and doing social media and these kinds of things, and that's fine in moderation, but people go to that for their for their identity and for their purpose so often in life. And then beyond that, you know, sometimes people resort to drugs and alcohol and drinking and, and kinds of things to just kind of dull, dull the pain, right? Lonely, loneliness has become an epidemic in our society. And this, is, this song was written a long time ago, but you may be familiar with the Beatles uh, song. It's probably 60 years old by now. But they had that song, Eleanor Rigby. Do you remember that one? And... Um, It's a song about loneliness. And and the chorus goes, all the lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? And my understanding of the Beatles is some of them kind of maybe dabbled in church a little bit as children. And I think um, John Lennon, when he was older, kind of explored Christianity a little bit. But they weren't weren't followers of Christ, you know. Um, I think in some cases they were critical of the church. They asked that question, "Where, where do we all belong? Well, we belong here. We belong among God's people. We belong under the grace of God so we can experience God's love for us and our relation, our love for each other as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Where do, where do we all belong? We belong together as the people of God. And I find it interesting that in, the song even seems to blame the church for people's loneliness. Uh, in one stanza it says, Father McKenzie, writing the words of a sermon that no one will hear, no one comes near. And I know, I understand that church is boring sometimes. Um, I understand that sermons can be boring sometimes. Um, But we don't come here to be entertained, right? We come here to experience the presence of God. We come here to give our hearts to him in worship, to celebrate the love that he has by expressing our love for him in return. Another reason that people commonly don't come to church, I've heard people say things like, well, uh, Jesus is okay, I just don't like his people, Right? They, they, they don't have the patience or the wherewithal or the, the will to invest themselves in deep relationships with other members of the family of faith, right? And um, I got an email from a good friend of mine who, from college 
just a few months ago. I hadn't talked to him in years. And he gave me this long email telling me about how his life, how things were going. And I'm just going to just, just grab a snippet of it. Um, he said, I need your help with the whole church thing. I, I've dabbled with a few churches here and there, but it's just not for me. I hate to say it, but I've pretty much given up on the two-leggeds. People have two legs. And he says, my retirement dream is to take, um, to take care of all the four-legged creatures in this world and, and the, who need a home. And so he, he's like, I'm tired of de dealing with people. The creatures have two legs. I just want to deal with the cats and the dogs, right? The, 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 the pets. Um, and that's because relationships with people are, is hard, right? The dog, you can just kind of push off the couch. When he's annoying me, I'm trying to watch TV. I just push him off the couch. Just get rid of him. But probably can't do the Baron. But you can do the Rafiki. He's 11 pounds. Just, yeah. he's gone. So, but people, people disagree with us. People argue with us. People um, betray us. People lie to us. People uh, disappoint us. Uh, people confuse us. And being in deep, meaningful relationships with people over an extended period of time is hard work. And it's, it's, it's difficult, and we, we struggle with that. And the dog you can put outside when I put him on a leash, you can't do that with your brother in Christ. <laughs> in, in, in a fallen world, relationships with people are hard. And so many of us just decide we're not going to deal with it. We'd rather just stay at home. And when we struggle, we say, I feel alone, I, I feel unloved. And so the church is a place where we express our love for God and our love for each other, and it's hard and it's difficult, and we, it can be a chore sometimes, it can be a battle sometimes, but it's worth it. Because the harder we work, the more invested we are in relationship with God and with one another, the more we experience God's presence in our life and, and the deeper sense we have of God's grace. When we learn how to deal with people who are annoying or we learn how to let them deal with us when we're annoying, we're practicing the grace of God with each other. And we're developing a stronger, richer, purer sense of God's grace for us, how he loves us, how he accepts us, how he includes us, he welcomes us. It wasn't easy for Jesus either, was it? I mean, we saw last week how he suffered and died for us, to be in relationship with us. Sometimes being in relationship with other people requires, on a much smaller scale, requires sacrifice. Requires heartache, requires determination, requires grace. And so whether we're the one annoying, lying, confusing, or the one others doing that to us, combination of both requires grace, requires patience, requires perseverance. But in the end, we have these deep, meaningful, strong, loving relationships and we don't say, I am alone. We don't say, I am unloved. We say, I'm welcomed. I'm included. I'm accepted. I'm loved. And that's what's so clear in this text. Uh, you look at, at First Peter. Peter says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so it's not just our individual relationship with God, but corporately we're in a relationship with God. We are a people, a holy people, God's own people, and we're in relationship with each other. A few years ago, um, we were heading up to Minnesota to see family, and we, we were driving, and we stopped in Indiana, and we usually stay in a hotel or we see friends when we're in Indiana. And this one particular time, uh, we stayed at a family's friend's house. They have a big house, a big family, wonderful people. And their kids and our kids were good friends when we lived in Indiana. I didn't really know the, the parents real well. And so I felt a little bit awkward staying at their house, felt a little bit uncomfortable. But they were so gracious and so kind, welcoming us to their home. And we had a wonderful time getting to know them. And before we left the next morning, uh, the father said to me something like how much he enjoyed having us. And he said, you all are our kind of people. And it felt so good that they extended that grace to us to welcome and accept us and then declare, you are our kind of people. That's what God does for us. By his grace, he welcomes us into his, his family, into this family of faith. And the text says, you have received mercy. 
And so those of us who have received mercy through faith in Christ, God says, you're my kind of people. Those of you who are humble enough to accept my grace, those of you who have the faith to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are my kind of people. And again, our identity is not as individuals only, but as a people, as a family of faith, as a community, as, as a holy nation. And so we're called to be in relationship with each other um, as well as just individually in relationship with God. And so that's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to this, this afternoon, going to the Malloys again. You know, you guys have been so gracious in opening your home. Seems like about once a fall, once a spring, we get together. And it's just such a, a wonderful thing. We go play our cornhole and volleyball and have a good time and you know, eat the burgers and um, all the brownies and all the... You guys don't forget to bring the desserts tonight, right? <laughs> But the fellowship we have is just, is just wonderful. And we experience God's presence together as a family of faith, as, as the people of God. And then when we say, who am I? Our response, our internal response is, I, is not, I am alone. It's, I'm loved and I'm accepted. I'm, I'm part of this family of faith. That's who I am. And as we seek to be more faithful to our true identity, God is at work within us. And it's like he's got his super glue out and the mirror is fractured and fragmented by our sin. But he's putting the pieces together. And as long as we're in this fallen world, as long as we're fallen people, we're not gonna clearly and perfectly reflect on his image to the world. But it gets better. And as the Holy Spirit is at work within us, we start to more faithfully and more truly and more consistently uh, reflect God's image for his glory and for our joy. And we long for, then, this fourth stage in history. And that's the time of consummation or, or glorification, depending on how you want to call it. Um, we're not perfect right now. There's, there's still the cracks in the mirror. But we long for that time when we will be made perfect, when we will become our perfect selves. And when we will then, without sin getting in our way, we will faithfully and truly reflect God's image to him, back up to himself for his glory and worship and to one another in love and, and fellowship. And we have a beautiful picture of that in, in several texts in the New Testament. In Matthew 8, 11, Jesus says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And we have this marvelous picture of fellowship. We'll be with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, and you know, all, the, all the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Old Testament, people from every time and place, and nation, every period in history, we'll all be together in this giant banquet hall, and it'll be just like we know each other perfectly. It's like the Easter dinner, hopefully you had last week, right? Or Thanksgiving or Christmas. You know, that deep sense of fellowship with family members and loved ones will be multiplied a million times over in the kingdom of heaven when we have this fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we have that, that horizontal relationship reflecting God's image to each other, and then we have the vertical relationship of reflecting God's image to him in, in worship as well, and that's so wonderfully depicted in Revelation 5, where John says, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. And we get this image from every time and place, myriads of myriads, ten thousands of ten thousands of people are going to be expressing our hearts to him, singing our praise to him in, in worship. We're reflecting his glory as we praise um, his name. And because we're fulfilling the purpose for which God has created us, our hearts are filled with joy. Now, at the end of the service, I'm going to roll the easel out there by the little offering thing that we have, whatever you call that thing. And I'm going to put it there so that as you leave, now I don't want you to stand in there clogging up the line, all right? But just take a quick glimpse at yourself in the mirror. And just be a reminder of who you are, created to reflect the image of God to him for his glory and to each other um, to express um, God's love for, for one another. Who are you? You're not alone. You're not unloved. You say, who am I? I am a member of this chosen race, this royal priesthood, this holy nation. 
I'm, I'm God's kind of people. Thanks be to God for what he's done for us. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our offering text for today is from Philippians. It's one of my favorites. You've heard it before. Philippians 4, 15 through 20. It says, You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I was in Macedonia, no one shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice pleasing and acceptable to God. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so may we give in our offering a sacrifice that's holy and pleasing to God, a fragrant offering.
There's glass underneath the monitor. <laughs> Sorry. Let's pray. <laughs> oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. We thank you, God. We can ask the question, who am I? And we remember that we are your children, made in your image, called to reflect your glory. We pray, Lord, that these tithes and offerings would be used for that purpose, to continue our worship here, to reflect your greatness in worship, that they be used for the purposes of um, helping others in need and, and sharing the love of Christ with those around us. But God, we pray that you consecrate these gifts, that they are a fragrant offering in your sight, and they'll be used for your glory. We love you, Lord, and we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we just served communion last week as it was Easter, but this is the first Sunday of the month, and so we're going to continue our tradition and uh, observe the Lord's Supper again today. Um, for those of you who are visitors today, um, this is an open table for all who profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We ask that you uh, feel free in coming forward and uh, receiving this gift. This is a meal in which we remember how Jesus' body was broken for us, how his blood was shed for us. And it's also a time in which we are reminded of the fellowship we have as God's people and sharing um, in, in this meal together. And so in that, in that thinking, with that mind, um, it's appropriate for us to um, offer a prayer of confession to God and preparing our hearts to receive his gift of grace. And so I want to invite you now to recite this confession of sin with me. Heavenly Father, we are people only because we have received your mercy. We confess that we don't always love and accept others as you have loved and accepted us. We ask you to forgive us. Help us to encourage those who think, I am alone or I am unloved. Help us to welcome them into your church and to affirm them as your people through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you welcome us and affirm us as your own. And we're so grateful, God, that in participating in this meal, it's a reminder that um, we are broken because of our sins. But your body, Christ's body, was broken um, to make reparation for our sins, to offer us forgiveness and salvation. We're, we're reminded, Lord, that our own sin incurs death upon ourselves, that, that blood must be shed. And yet we thank you that Jesus was willing to allow his blood to be shed for us to receive forgiveness and salvation and the gift of eternal life. Uh, Lord, we thank you that this meal is holy communion, that we're brought together in community as we participate in it with each other. May you strengthen the bonds of friendship here as well as our relationship with you by the work of your Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord God, and we're so grateful for this expression of your grace and mercy uh, given to us as your people. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed for you for the shedding of your blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. And so I'm going to ask Greg to come forward and help me to serve this meal. We'll have two lines, so if you're on this side, come down around, receive from Greg. If you come down this side, receive the elements uh, from me, if you would, please. All right, the meal is prepared. Uh, please come forward.
Oh, Lord God, we're so grateful for this sacred moment that you've given to us. We thank you for this reminder and this wonderful confirmation that Jesus broke his body. He allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be shed for our forgiveness and salvation, that you've redeemed us from sin, and that you've made us a new creation in Christ Jesus. And we thank you, God, that as we may ask, who am I? The answer is loud and clear, that we are loved, that we are welcomed, that we are uh, members of your family and of your kingdom uh, because you have given us your mercy. And for that, we praise you. Help us to more faithfully reflect your image in the world uh, for your glory and for our joy and as a witness to others of the grace and mercy that is offered in Christ Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Please stand uh, for the blessing now. As we go out from this place, um, may we remind you that our identity is not found in the world. We are not who others may think that we are. We are not defined by um, the world's definitions of success or goodness or what is right, what is popular. We can ask, who am I? And we know that through faith in Christ, we are loved, we are welcomed, we are accepted. We are members of God's holy family, his holy nation, um, his own people. And for that, we praise him. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. We'll see you right here next week, everybody. Have a great Sunday.